Book 20, Signs and a Vision Outside in the entryway he made his bed, raw oxhide spread on level ground, and heaped up fleeces, left from sheep the Achaeans killed. And when he had lain down, Eurynome flung out a robe to cover him. Unsleeping the lord Odysseus lay, and roved in thought to the undoing of his enemies. Now came a covey of women laughing as they slipped out, arm in arm as many a night before, to the suitors' beds, and anger took him like a wave to leap into their midst and kill them, every one, or should he let them all go hot to bed one final night? His heart cried out within him the way a brock with whelps between her legs would howl and bristle at a stranger, so the hackles of his heart rose at that laughter. Knocking his breast he muttered to himself, down, be steady. You've seen worse, that time the kicklops like a rock slide ate your men while you looked on. Nobody, only guile, got you out of that cave alive. His rage held hard in leash, submitted to his mind, while he himself rocked, rolling from side to side, as a cook turns a sausage, big with blood and fat, at a scorching blaze. Without a pause, to broil it quick, so he rolled left and right, casting about to see how he, alone, against the false outrageous crowd of suitors could press the fight. And out of the night sky Athena came to him, out of the nearby darkened body like a woman, came and stood over his head to chide him. Why so wakeful, most forlorn of men? Here is your home, there lies your lady, and your son is here, as fine as one could wish a son to be. Odysseus looked up and answered, I, goddess, that much is true, but still I have some cause to fret in this affair. I am one man, how can I whip those dogs? They are always here in force. Neither is that the end of it, there's more to come. If by the will of Zeus and by your will I killed them all, where could I go for safety? Tell me that. And the grey, I goddess said, you're touching faith. Another man would trust some villainous mortal, with no brains, and what am I? Your goddess, guardian to the end in all your trials. Let it be plain as day, if fifty bands of men surrounded us and every sword sang for your blood, you could make off still with their cows and sheep. Now you too, go to sleep. This all-night vigil wearies the flesh. You'll come out soon enough on the other side of trouble. Raining soft sleep on his eyes, the beautiful one was gone back to Olympos. Now at peace, the man slumbered and lay still, but not his lady. Wakeful again with all her cares, reclining in the soft bed, she wept and cried aloud until she had had her fill of tears, then spoke in prayer first to Artemis, O gracious divine lady Artemis, daughter of Zeus, if you could only make an end now quickly, let the arrow fly, stop my heart, or if some wind could take me by the hair up into running cloud, to plunge in tides of ocean, as hurricane winds took Pandario's daughters when they were left at home alone. The gods had sapped their parents' lives. But Aphrodite fed those children honey, cheese and wine, and Hera gave them looks and wit, and Artemis, pure Artemis, gave lovely height, and wise Athena made them practiced in her arts, till Aphrodite in glory walked on Olympos, begging for each a happy wedding day from Zeus the lightning's joyous king, who knows all fate of mortals, fair and foul, but even at that hour the cyclone winds had ravished them away to serve the loathsome furies. Let me be blown out by the Olympians. Shot by Artemis, I still might go and see amid the shades Odysseus and the rot of underworld. No cowards I should light by my consenting. Evil may be endured when our days pass in mourning, heavy, hearted, hard beset, if only sleep reign over nighttime, blanketing the world's good and evil from our eyes. But not for me, dreams too my demon sends me. Tonight the image of my lord came by as I remember him with troops. O oh strange exultation! I thought him real, and not a dream. Now as the dawn appeared all stitched in gold, the queen's cry reached Odysseus at his waking, so that he wondered, half asleep, it seemed she knew him, and stood near him. Then he woke and picked his bedding up to stow away on a chair in the megaron. The oxhide pad he took outdoors. There, spreading wide his arms, he prayed, O Father Zeus, if over land and water, after adversity, you will to bring me home, let someone in the waking house give me good augury, and a sign be shown, too, in the outer world. He prayed thus, and the mind of Zeus in heaven heard him. He thundered out of bright Olympos down from above the cloudlands, in reply, a rousing peal for Odysseus. Then a token came to him from a woman grinding flour in the court nearby. 
His own hand mills were there, and twelve maids had the job of grinding out whole grain and barley meal, the pith of men. Now all the rest, their bushels ground, were sleeping, one only, frail and slow, kept at it still. She stopped, stayed her hand, and her lord heard the omen from her lips, Ah, Father Zeus Almighty over gods and men! A great bang of thunder that was, surely, out of the starry sky, and not a cloud in sight. It is your nod to someone. Hear me, then, make what I say come true, let this day be the last the suitors feed so dainty in Odysseus Hall. They've made me work my heart out till I drop, grinding barley. May they feast no more. The servant's prayer, after the cloudless thunder of Zeus, Odysseus heard with lifting heart, sure in his bones that vengeance was at hand. Then other servants, wakening, came down to build and light a fresh fire at the hearth. Telemachus, clear, eyed as a god, awoke, put on his shirt and belted on his sword, bound rawhide sandals under his smooth feet, and took his bronze, shod lance. He came and stood on the broad sill of the doorway, calling Eurycleia, Nurse, dear nurse, how did you treat our guest? Had he a supper and a good bed? Has he lain uncared for still? My mother is like that, perverse for all her cleverness, she'd entertain some riff, raff, and turn out a solid man. The old nurse answered him, I would not be so quick to accuse her, child. He sat and drank here while he had a mind to, food he no longer hungered for, he said, for she did ask him. When he thought of sleeping, she ordered them to make a bed. Poor soul! Poor gentleman! So humble and so miserable, he would accept no bed with rugs to lie on, but slept on sheepskins and a raw oxhide in the entryway. We covered him ourselves. Telemachus left the hall, hefting his lance, with two swift flickering hounds for company, to face the island Achaeans in the square, and gently born Eurycleia, the daughter of Ops Pisenarides, called to the maids, bestir yourselves. You have your brooms, go sprinkle the rooms and sweep them, robe the chairs in red, sponge off the tables till they shine. Wash out the wine bowls in two, handled cups. You others go fetch water from the spring, no loitering, come straight back. Our company will be here soon, morning is sure to bring them, everyone has a holiday today. The women ran to obey her, twenty girls off to the spring with jars for dusky water, the rest at work inside. Then tall woodcutters entered to split up logs for the hearth fire, the water carriers returned, and on their heels arrived the swineherd, driving three fat pigs, chosen among his pens. In the wide court he let them feed, and said to Odysseus kindly, Friend, are they more respectful of you now, or still insulting you? Replied Odysseus, the young men, yes. And may the gods requite those insolent puppies for the game they play in a home not their own. They have no decency. During this talk, Melanthios the goat herd came in, driving goats for the suitors' feast with his two herdsmen. Under the portico they tied the animals, and Melanthios looked at Odysseus with a sneer. Said he, Stranger, I see you mean to stay and turn our stomachs begging in this hall. Clear out, why don't you? Or will you have to taste a bloody beating before you see the point? Your begging weighs nauseate everyone. There are feasts elsewhere. Odysseus answered not a word, but grimly shook his head over his murderous heart. A third man came up now, Philoishios the cattle foreman, with an ox behind him and fat goats for the suitors. Ferrymen had brought these from the mainland, as they bring travelers, too, whoever comes along. Philoishios tied the beasts under the portico and joined the swineherd. Who is this, he said, who is the new arrival at the manor? Achaean? Or what else does he claim to be? Where are his family and fields of home? Down on his luck, all right, carries himself like a captain. How the immortal gods can change and drag us down once they begin to spin dark days for us. Kings and commanders, too. Then he stepped over and took Odysseus by the right hand, saying, Welcome, sir. May good luck lie ahead at the next turn. Hard times you're having, surely. O oh, Zeus! No god is more berserk in heaven if gentle folk, whom you yourself begot, you plunge in grief and hardship without mercy. Sir, I began to sweat when I first saw you, and tears came to my eyes, remembering Odysseus, rags like these he may be wearing somewhere on his wanderings now, I mean, if he's alive still under the sun. 
but if he's dead and in the house of death, I mourn Odysseus. He entrusted cows to me in Cephalenia, when I was knee-high, and now his herds are numberless, no man else ever had cattle multiply like grain. But new men tell me I must bring my beeves to feed them, who care nothing for our prince, fear nothing from the watchful gods. They crave partition of our lost king's land and wealth. My own feelings keep going round and round upon this tether, can I desert the boy by moving, herds and all, to another country, a new life among strangers? Yet it's worse to stay here, in my old post, herding cattle for upstarts. I'd have gone long since, gone, taken service with another king, the shame is no more to be borne, but I keep thinking my own lord, poor devil, still might come and make a rout of suitors in his hall. Odysseus, with his mind on action, answered, Herdsman, I make you out to be no coward and no fool, I can see that for myself. So let me tell you this. I swear by Zeus all highest, by the table set for friends, and by your king's hearthstone to which I've come, Odysseus will return. You'll be on hand to see, if you care to see it, how those who lord it here will be cut down. The cowman said, would God it all came true. You'd see the fight that's in me. Then Eumaeus echoed him, and invoked the gods, and prayed that his great, minded master should return. While these three talked, the suitors in the field had come together plotting, what but death for Telemachus? When from the left an eagle crossed high with a rock dove in his claws. Amphinomos got up. Said he, cutting them short, friends, no luck lies in that plan for us, no luck, knifing the lad. Let's think of feasting. A grateful thought, they felt, and walking on entered the great hall of the hero Odysseus, where they all dropped their cloaks on chairs or couches, and made a ritual slaughter, knifing sheep, fat goats and pigs, knifing the grass, fed steer. Then tripes were broiled and eaten. Mixing bowls were filled with wine. The swineherd passed out cups, Philoitios, chief cowherd, dealt the loaves into the panniers, Melanthios poured wine, and all their hands went out upon the feast. Telemachus placed his father to advantage just at the door sill of the pillared hall, setting a stool there and a sod, off table, gave him a share of tripes, poured out his wine in a golden cup and said, stay here, sit down to drink with our young friends. I stand between you and any cutting word or cuffing hand from any suitor. Here is no public house but the old home of Odysseus, my inheritance. Hold your tongues then, gentlemen, and your blows, and let no wrangling start, no scuffle either. The others, disconcerted, bit their lips at the ring in the young man's voice. Antinous, you paved son, turned round to them and said, It goes against the grain, my lords, but still I say we take this hectoring by Telemachus. You know Zeus balked at it, or else we might have shut his mouth a long time past, the silvery speaker. But Telemachus paid no heed to what Antinous said. Now public heralds wound through Ithaca leading a file of beasts for sacrifice, and islanders gathered under the shade trees of Apollo, in the precinct of the archer, while in hall the suitors roasted mutton and fat beef on skewers, pulling off the fragrant cuts, and those who did the roasting served Odysseus a portion equal to their own, for so Telemachus commanded. But Athena had no desire now to let the suitors restrain themselves from wounding words and acts. Laertes' son again must be offended. There was a scapegrace fellow in the crowd named Tisippos, a Samian, rich beyond all measure, arrogant with riches, early and late a bitter for Odysseus' queen. Now this one called attention to himself, hear me, my lords, I have a thing to say. Our friend has had his fair share from the start, and that's polite, it would be most improper if we were cold to guests of Telemachus, no matter what tramp turns up. Well then, look here, let me throw in my own small contribution. He must have prizes to confer, himself, on some brave bathman or another slave here in Odysseus' house. His hand went backward and, fishing out a cow's foot from the basket, he let it fly. Odysseus rolled his head to one side softly, ducking the blow, and smiled a crooked smile with teeth clenched. On the wall the cow's foot struck and fell. Telemachus blazed up, to Sippos, lucky for you, by heaven, not to have hit him. He took care of himself, else you'd have had my lance, head in your belly, no marriage, but a grave instead on Ithaca for your father's pains. You others, let me see no more contemptible conduct in my house. 
I've been awake to it for a long time, by now I know what is honorable and what is not. Before, I was a child. I can endure it while sheep are slaughtered, wine drunk up and bread, can one man check the greed of a hundred men? But I will suffer no more viciousness. Granted you mean at last to cut me down, I welcome that, better to die than have humiliation always before my eyes, the stranger buffeted, and the serving women dragged about, abused in a noble house. They quieted, grew still, under his lashing, and after a long silence, Agilos, Damaster's son, spoke to them all, friends, friends, I hope no one will answer like a fishwife. What has been said is true. Hands off this stranger, he is no target, neither is any servant here in the hall of King Odysseus. Let me say a word, though, to Telemachus and to his mother, if it please them both, as long as hope remained in you to see Odysseus, that great gifted man, again, you could not be reproached for obstinacy, tying the suitors down here, better so, if still your father fared the great sea homeward. How plain it is, though, now, he'll come no more. Go sit then by your mother, reason with her, tell her to take the best man, highest bidder, and you can have and hold your patrimony, feed on it, drink it all, while she adorns another's house. Keeping his head, Telemachus replied, by Zeus Almighty, Agilos, and by my father's sufferings, far from Ithaca, whether he's dead or lost, I make no impediment to mother's marriage. Take whom you wish, I say, I'll add my dowry. But can I pack her off against her will from her own home? Heaven forbid. At this, Pallas Athena touched off in the suitors a fit of laughter, uncontrollable. She drove them into nightmare, till they wheezed and neighed as though with jaws no longer theirs, while blood defiled their meat, and blurring tears flooded their eyes, heart sore with woe to come. Then said the visionary, Theacal and Minos, O lost sad men, what terror is this you suffer? Night shrouds you to the knees, your heads, your faces, dry wretch of death runs round like fire in sticks, your cheeks are streaming, these fair walls and pedestals are dripping crimson blood. And thick with shades is the entryway, the courtyard thick with shades passing a thirst toward Erebos, into the dark, the sun is quenched in heaven, foul mist hems us in, the young men greeted this with shouts of laughter, and Eurymachos, the son of Polybos, crowed, the mind of our new guest has gone astray. Hustle him out of doors, lads, into the sunlight, he finds it dark as night inside. The man of vision looked at him and said, When I need help, I'll ask for it, Eurymachos. I have my eyes and ears, a pair of legs, and a straight mind, still with me. These will do to take me out. Damnation and black night I see arriving for yourselves, no shelter, no defense for any in this crowd, fools and vipers in the king's own hall. With this he left that handsome room and went home to Piraeus, who received him kindly. The suitors made wide eyes at one another and set to work provoking Telemachus with jokes about his friends. One said, for instance, Telemachus, no man is a luckier host when it comes to what the cat dragged in. What burning eyes your beggar had for bread and wine. But not for labor, not for a single heave, he'd be a deadweight on a field. Then comes this other, with his mumbo, jumbo. Boy, for your own good, I tell you, toss them both into a slave ship for the Sikels. That would pay you. Telemachus ignored the suitor's talk. He kept his eyes in silence on his father, awaiting the first blow. Meanwhile the daughter of Icarios, Penelope, had placed her chair to look across and down on father and son at bay, she heard the crowd, and how they laughed as they resumed their dinner, a fragrant feast, for many beasts were slain, but as for supper, men supped never colder than these, on what the goddess and the warrior were even then preparing for the suitors, whose treachery had filled that house with pain.